Hey everybody, Jake here from CVP. Today, we are comparing four sub £2,500 camera systems. The Fujifilm X-H2S, Sony FX30, Panasonic GH6, and Blackmagic Pocket 6K Pro. These four cameras offer some awesome bang for their buck, and in this video, we'll be breaking down each aspect of them so you can understand their pros, their cons, and why you may want to pick one up as your next camera. All four of these cameras are incredibly similarly priced, but pricing can change, so please head over to our website for accurate pricing. In this comparison, we'll be taking a look at the Pocket 6K Pro, as it's the most similar in price to the others, but the Pocket 6K G2 is nearly £500 cheaper and is essentially a 6K Pro with the built-in ND system removed and a slightly different rear LCD, which has a lower peak brightness compared to the 1500 nits one on the Pro. Otherwise, it features all the same great features the Pro does, which we'll be looking at in this video. Right, let's check out each camera's image quality. We've shot creative imagery with each of these cameras in the past, so we'll be peppering in some shots throughout the video from each of them. But if you want to see more examples, you can via the larger reviews for each camera, which we have linked in the description below. The Panasonic GH6 features a 5.8K Micro Four Thirds sensor, whereas the X-H2S, Pocket 6K Pro, and FX30 all feature 6K Super 35 sensors. You can capture upwards of 4K with the X-H2S, Pocket 6K, and GH6, whereas the FX30 is limited to 4K, but is downsampling a portion of its 6K sensor into its 4K image, which is great when it comes to noise and general image quality. You can also downsample in-camera with the GH6, X-H2S, and Pocket 6K in certain modes. I personally think 6K is a really great acquisition resolution though. It's not quite as data heavy as 8K, but also has enough resolution that you can downsample your footage in post to gain image quality benefits and still be able to crop, reframe, or stabilize without losing a true 4K delivery resolution. For our latitude test between the cameras, we use the exposure tools in each camera to expose for mid gray on our chart, keeping the chart, SAM, and the lighting in the same position. We use the low base ISO for each camera and use the same Zeiss Otis 55mm across all four systems, adjusting for the difference in exposure using shutter speed. Given that we had slightly different size sensors, we moved the cameras to adjust the subject and chart size in the frame and all shots were normalized in Resolve. Starting at three stops over, each camera performs well, with stuff getting a bit dicey at around four stops. Out of the bunch, I think the Pocket 6K Pro does the best at handling the clipping on Sam's skin, thanks to the highlight recovery possible when shooting B-Raw. The X-H2S does excellently though, performing well here as well. I would then say the FX30 is a little bit worse than that, followed lastly by the GH6. When it comes to underexposure, things start getting noisy at around three stops across each camera. The X-H2S is the only one out of the bunch that doesn't suffer from CMOS smear in these tests, with the Pocket 6K Pro probably being the worst. Past four, we can see the Pocket 6K shift in green, whereas the rest shift more purple. The FX30 performs well here and so does the X-H2S. If you want to see these shots in more detail back to back, we've put a long cut to our tests on our Vimeo, link to that is in the description. The colour a camera produces can be quite a subjective thing. So here's the same scene with each camera using their default Rec.709 LUTs or profiles, so you can judge which one you like out of the camera. However, I think with some work, you can get them all looking very good in this regard. From experience, colouring the B-roll footage out of the Pocket 6K is going to give you the best experience though, but that's not surprising. Looking at rolling shutter, the X-H2S has to be the best performing, though how fast it is will depend on the F-Log profile you are in due to the bit readout changing when switching between them. The FX30 and GH6 are similar with pretty obvious jello, and the Pocket 6K definitely has the slowest readout speed out of the bunch here. The GH6 is the only camera out of the lot that doesn't have a dual base ISO sensor. In Vlog, without dynamic range boost mode on, the base is 250, and with boost mode on, it's 2000. The X-H2S isn't marketed as such, but in F-Log2, the base ISO is 1250, but we can see a clear step in noise at the 3200 ISO point. The FX30's two bases are 800 and 2500 in S-Log3, and the Pocket 6Ks are 400 and 3200. All four cameras are pretty sensitive, which is very helpful for lower light scenarios. From our testing, the FX30 and X-H2S perform the best in low light scenarios. The FX30 looks to hold colors slightly better, whereas the X-H2S looks a touch more detailed. However, if you want a low light camera, the A7S III and FX3 are the current kings of that, but I know they are a good amount more expensive than these cameras. You can dial in noise reduction in camera on each system apart from the Pocket 6Ks. 
This does mean that you will most likely need to apply some noise reduction in post if you don't expose perfectly every time, which sometimes is impossible. Luckily, Resolve Studio, which this camera comes with, has an excellent denoiser built in, so running your clips through Resolve is a great idea for not only colouring, but also to help with noise. Just bear in mind this will increase render times. For some users, a camera's inbuilt image stabilisation is a crucial feature. The Pocket 6K doesn't have any sensor stabilisation, so grabbing an optically stabilised lens or making sure the camera is correctly supported is crucial to not get horrible shaky footage. The Pocket is definitely aimed at being a more cinema focused camera, so this isn't surprising to see, as there aren't too many cinema cameras that have inbuilt image stabilisation systems. However, earlier this year, Blackmagic released new firmware for the Pocket series that allows them to capture gyroscopic data of your camera into its B-Raw files, which can then be used in Resolve to stabilise your footage fast. This is similar to what Sony has introduced into a couple of their systems as well, such as the FX30. As well as the gyro metadata capture possible with the FX30, it also has Sony's fantastically reliable in-body image stabilisation system. This system is able to achieve up to 5.5 stops of stabilisation, and in the menu you can change between three different modes, off, steady shot and active. Steady shot is your regular IBIS that Sony has had in their cameras for a while now. Active mode is designed for video mode and aims to optimise the system for handheld video shooting. This then crops in on the image by electronically stabilising the footage by roughly 12.5%. And this does a really good job at stabilising the image and could be a good thing to have in camera for some people. The GH6 features Panasonic's best IBIS system to date and it is truly excellent. When you combine lens stabilisation, sensor and some of the extra modes in the camera, it has some serious stabilisation power. If you are using a native lens that has an OIS switch on, this will turn all stabilisation on and off. If the lens doesn't have this, you'll have to toggle sensor IS on and off in the menu. There are also two key modes worth understanding. E-stabilisation is its third level of stabilisation that crops in on the sensor to give you even more stabilisation on top of the lens and the sensor stabilisation, and boost mode which has been designed to emulate tripod shots, and panning or moving with this will introduce some weird movements, but it does a great job for locked off style shots. The X-H2S also features an IBIS system which Fuji states should provide up to 7 stops of stabilisation. There are also plenty of Fuji lenses with optical stabilisation built in, and the camera also has a digital stabilisation feature which will crop in a little bit to provide even more stabilisation power, though this is limited up to 60p. This is good for locked off shots, but not while walking or any kind of movement to be honest. The performance of the IBIS is alright, but not quite as good as some of its competition here. When it comes to recording formats, they're actually quite a bit different from each other. Starting with the FX30, it can record in XAVC HS 4K, XAVC S 4K, XAVC S HD, XAVC S I 4K and XAVC S I HD. This is a good mix of long GOP and intra formats and has a good range of options for capturing in 4210 bit. It's probably got the least amount of options out of the bunch, but plenty for most people at this price point and the larger bit rates still look great. Next, the Fuji X-H2S. You can record in a mix of different resolutions from 6K 3x2 all the way down to 1080p at a range of frame rates in both 16x and 17x9 aspect ratios. Depending on what resolution you're in, you can also record in ProRes internally which is awesome, and you can do this in HQ, 422 or LT. And then you also have H.265 and H.264 in either all eye or long gop compressions. There are so many choices here that it actually could be a little bit confusing or daunting for someone who is new to filmmaking. ProRes will result in larger file sizes, but will perform better in post than H.265 rushes. H.264 will perform better, but is limited to 4208 bit, which isn't ideal when shooting an F-Log. Panasonic have always done a great job at putting good recording formats into their cameras, and the GH6 is no exception. And it's even bested their previous cameras thanks to the ability to record pros internally as well. This added to the mix means that there are plenty of internal formats to choose from, no matter what you need to record for a given production. The camera has so many options, but again this could be a bit daunting for someone who doesn't understand everything that's going on here. The Pocket 6K Pro is the winner in my mind though, as it can record in both ProRes and Blackmagic's RAW format. ProRes is of course great for fast turnaround projects, but B-RAW is the real standout here. Being able to record this internally is great as long as your NLE supports it, which most do now. Not having to attach an external recorder to capture RAW or ProRes will result in some much nicer rigs and save you from having to shed out for a recorder and accessories that surround it. B-RAW works really well in both Resolve and Premiere Pro and will really make manipulating your footage a breeze. When shooting B-RAW, the capture data is stored as 12-bit log and is then decoded by Resolve into 16-bit linear, 
whereas the other three cameras are only able to capture 10 bit internally. 12 bit is possible with them, but a compatible external recorder is required to shoot ProRes RAW on them or B RAW with the XH2S. And here's a few charts of each camera's HDMI output options. We've done a whole video talking through B RAW in the past, so I've put a link to that in the description below if you want to learn more about it. The Pocket 6K cameras also all come with a copy of their fantastic Resolve Studio, which really allows you to get the most out of the B-roll rushes that you're shooting. Getting this incredible piece of software for free with an already very affordable camera is amazing. As we've mentioned, having the ability to capture above 4K is great for a range of things, but one thing I have noticed is that the performance in post resolutions above 4K with these cameras is quite a bit worse than with 4K. So make sure you check that your post-production workflow can handle the increased resolution with whatever format you end up wanting to use mainly. When it comes to slow motion, I would say the GH6 has the best options. You can record 5.7K up to 60, UHD 4K up to 120, and Full HD 42 up to 240, or 420 up to 300. The XH2S can record 6.2K up to 30p, and then up to 120p in DCI 4K or 1080p. The FX30 is limited to full sensor 4K up to 60 frames per second, but can go up to 120 with a 1.5 times crop. Though this is still 4K, as it's essentially windowing in from 6K down to 4K. In 1080p, you can shoot up to 240 frames per second. The Pocket 6K is probably the most limited. It can record up to 50p in its full sensor mode. And as you window in on the sensor, your maximum frame rate increases. So you can go up to 120 FPS in 2.8K, but there is a heavy crop here. Each camera also has a good range of base frame rates that you can easily switch between given your chosen situation. Here's the list for each camera's options. All four of these cameras don't have any hard-coded recording limits unlike mirrorless cameras of the past, but with smaller cameras that can record video, how a camera handles the massive amount of heat that can be generated is a really important piece of the camera design puzzle, and each of these cameras handles things a little bit differently. First off, the Pocket 6Ks. These cameras have the most robust cooling system and use a fan with the massive vents to pull cool air in and exhaust hot air out of the camera. These cameras can get quite toasty though, but I personally haven't had one overheat on me while shooting at all. The GH6 also has an active cooling system that is similar to the one found on the Pocket 6Ks, but air is pulled through the vents here instead. This means that the GH6 has much better run times than the more passively cooled systems and something Panasonic needed to do with the new internal capabilities of the GH6. The FX30 also uses a cooling fan system, which results in no issues when it comes to overheating. But if you want to decrease your chances of running into this, you can by going into the menu and turning off the auto power off temp. However, you are doing this at your own risk. The XH2S doesn't have an active cooling system built into the camera, but it does have an optional fan that can connect onto the back of the camera and help manage heat when recording video. I like the idea of it being an extra for people who do need it, and the system they have designed for it of getting it on and off is nice. It just limits the motion of the rear LCD. It's an optional accessory, so it will cost you £169 on top of the camera cost. And while it is good to have the option, I just worry about losing or breaking it or something. During our time shooting with the camera, we didn't use the fan and haven't run into any issues of overheating, though in hotter climates, your mileage may vary. The Pocket 6K Pro features an internal ND system, which is really unique in this kind of camera at this price point. The system uses a clear filter and then two, four and six stop IR NDs. This is great to have in camera and really unless you are only shooting in a studio environment you're going to love having ND filters built into your camera. The only downside is that the 6K Pro does suffer from pretty heavy IR pollution and this still happens with these NDs. To prevent this you need to make sure you use either a better quality ND with more IR cut or just a straight IR cut filter when shooting in scenarios when IR pollution is more likely. The more affordable 6K G2 or 6K do not have this internal ND system built in which is partly why they both cost less. The GH6, XH2S and FX30, like the G2, do not have a built-in ND system. So for these, you'll have to use one of the various methods of using filters, such as a matte box or directly screwed onto your lens. I do wish that there were more drop-in filter systems for E and X mount, like there are for RF mount. It's actually kind of bizarre that there isn't any for E mount when it's been such a popular mount for video shooters for years now. I wonder why. Physically, the Pocket 6Ks are definitely the odd ones out, while the other three cameras are more designed like normal hybrid mirrorless cameras. The 6K is kind of a mashup of a hybrid camera and a more cine focus camera. It's by far the biggest and heaviest, but does have the biggest cooling and monitor on the back of it. 
which will change depending on which Pocket 6K you grab. Both have the ability to flip out, but the Pro Monitor is a much brighter 1500 nit variant version, which makes it much better for viewing in brighter scenarios over the one on the G2, which looks to be around a third as bright. You also have the choice to grab the optional EVF, which can be attached either directly to the body or via an extension cable that Tilter have produced for it, which could make for some interesting configurations. It's by far the heaviest and largest out of the bunch, which will make it a little less inconspicuous to use and harder to get onto smaller gimbals. One little detail I do like is that the camera has two quarter 20 threads on the bottom of it, which means that you can securely mount a tripod or gimbal plate onto the bottom of the camera without worrying about it spinning on a single thread. I really wish more companies did this on smaller cameras. The FX30 is probably my favorite physically to use out of all four of them, especially with the top handle. It's great ergonomically and it is really light and compact. You can rig it up with some extra weight and size if you need to, or use it really stripped down if it's better for you to do so. It doesn't have an EVF like the other cameras, which may be a deal breaker for some people though. The FX30 also has three nice bright tally lights across its body that make it nice and obvious when you hit the record button. The rear LCD is fully articulating and is very similar to the one on the X-H2S. The button layout on the FX30 is also fantastic, though I do like rebinding the center of the wheel at the back to record as the record buttons can be a bit difficult to get to at times. The X-H2S is very similar to Fujifilm's other range of stills focused cameras, and it's clearly still a photo first physical design. It's really great ergonomically for shooting stills and you can definitely get the job done shooting video. I would just rebind a few things in the menu. The EVF is excellent, and thanks to the cooling solution being an optional attachment, it is also weather resistant. Physically, the GH6 is kind of like the GH5 II and S1H had a baby. In the hand, the camera feels more substantial than previous MFT cameras from Panasonic, and when compared to the FX30 and X-H2S, it actually feels the largest out of the three of them, which is surprising given it's the smallest sensor size. But I do think the extra cooling has added a lot of bulk to the GH6. It also has a nice rear LCD design it can be flipped out as well as rotated. It's the best mechanism out of the bunch for this. We've used each one of these cameras a good amount and they all have different operational quirks and features. The 6K Pro is the one most obviously designed for video acquisition. This menu system is so clear and simply laid out while still being packed full of video functions and features. If you've used any of the current Blackmagic cameras, you'll be able to operate any of their other lines as they keep the system pretty much identical between them, which is great. There's a great range of exposure and monitoring tools and everything is really fast to change. These cameras are really great if you are new to filmmaking and want to learn because they are so, so simple to use. Panasonic do a great job of giving a really comprehensive range of settings for stills and video and they seriously have packed so much into the GH6 and it's one of the reasons why so many people love their cameras. They often feature much more video orientated features and settings than Sony's Alpha series and Fuji's cameras for example. However, the FX30 and FX3, since the introduction of version 2 firmware, really stand apart from the Alpha series. And the gap between them and Panasonic has been narrowed slightly, but I think the GH6 does edge it out a little bit. The FX30 uses Sony's most up-to-date Alpha series menu system, and it's their best one to date. It also features loads of improvements over those cameras that have helped separate the FX series out from them. It has a solid punching function, excellent custom white balance, and good customizable zebras for exposing. I just wish we had a waveform. It also has some more unique features like focus breathing correction and a focus map tool that the others do not. The X-H2S feels the most lackluster out of all the cameras. Its visual style is like previous Fuji cameras and it does lack some of the features that the other cameras have. While it is great how many different formats and codecs you can choose from, the menu when selecting these can be quite cumbersome to use. It does feature peaking and zebras, but the Zebras tool isn't great as you can't go down low enough to expose mid-grey in F-Log2, which is really annoying. The Pocket 6K and GH6 have the ability to use shutter angle instead of speed, whereas the FX30 and X-H2S are limited to just shutter speed. When it comes to battery life, they all use different batteries. The Pocket 6K G2 and Pro use the industry standard Sony MPF style, which I'm sure you have seen before as they have been on the market for years now. This is a big improvement over the LP6 in the original 6K and 4K, which would absolutely rip through them. The 6K G2 and Pro will give you roughly an hour's worth of recording time before dying on a single battery, but the brightness of the rear LCD will change this. The GH6 uses the same Panasonic battery as previous cameras, and a single battery should last you around an hour when recording in 5.7K. 
The XH2S uses Fuji's MPW235S battery type and should last around 90 minutes when recording in video mode, and the FX30 uses the MPFZ100 and should last you around 120 minutes when recording in 4K. The GH6, XH2S and FX30 can be powered remotely using either dummy batteries or the USB-C ports on the side of their bodies. These can be a really cost-effective or nicely rigged solution for powering your camera package. The Pocket 6K's USB-C port can be used to power the camera, but it trickle charges the battery in the camera, so you need to have it in there to use a USB source. However, the better option is to use an external battery using the 2-pin Limo port with the correct cable, but it's good you have both options at least. At this price point, the biggest thing talked about when it comes to I.O. is, does it have a full-size HDMI port? And yes, each camera does. The GH6, XH2S and FX30's I.O. layouts are all pretty similar. They are all on the left hand side of the camera and features stuff like USB-C, which can actually be used to record directly to SSDs on the GH6, and 3.5mm inputs for mics and outputs for headphones. The Pocket 6K is definitely the standout here though. It has two mini XLR inputs for audio and a locking 2-pin Limo for power input. If you decide to use third party batteries with the camera or a DC power supply, this is much nicer than using USB or a dummy battery. When it comes to audio, the GH6, XH2S and FX30 all feature very similar options. The preamps on these cameras 3.5mm inputs aren't fantastic, so if you really want great audio quality, you'll need to grab either the audio modules for a given system or an external recorder. Each of these three systems have top XLR audio modules. The FX30 has the option to come with the top handle XLR unit, which is essentially an XLR K3M unit, which can also be used with it as well. And the XH2S has a module from Tascam and the GH6 has the XLR 1E. All of these offer better preamps, full size XLR inputs and physical controls for audio and are great additions to these cameras if you require better audio options. They all communicate directly via the hot shoot of each system, which is great for keeping your rig free from cables. However, the Pocket 6Ks do offer dual mini XLR inputs with decent preamps on the body, which does make recording audio directly into the camera a decent option with the correct cables. Autofocus is still a hotly debated factor of cine and video cameras, but it's definitely a massive factor for many people, especially at this price point, where you may be running around with the camera by yourself. Having reliable and advanced autofocus can make shots possible that normally wouldn't be for solo operators. The Pocket 6K cameras have the most basic autofocus functions. It's so average in fact, I wouldn't even class it as having an autofocus system at all. Realistically, the camera is aimed at people who want to pull focus manually and is one of the camera's few compromises. Both the GH6 and XH2S feature improved autofocus systems over previous models from both brands. They both perform great when taking stills but when recording video, it's where we can start to see inconsistencies in their performance. They both do a solid job of tracking subjects, but sometimes you can see the camera struggle to translate this into consistent focusing. They are both two of the best performing in the brand's lineups, but comparatively to the FX30, they definitely miss the mark. The FX30 system is by far the best when it comes to video and stills. You can really easily control how it performs and the camera's tracking and speed of focusing is the best by quite a large margin especially when recording video. If reliable and accurate autofocus is your priority, the FX30 is the obvious choice. But the XH2S and the GH6 systems can work well in the right scenarios with the right lenses in the right lighting. While our channel mainly focuses on all things moving image, the GH6 and XH2S are both hybrid cameras and they can both capture some great stills. They do operate slightly differently to each other, but they will allow you to get the job done well with great image quality However, I would say I prefer both the usability and the image of the XH2S. Autofocus is also much better in stills mode on the GH6 and the XH2S than when recording in video. There are plenty of videos out on YouTube already talking about these cameras from a stills perspective, so we won't go too in depth on them here. The FX30 has restricted stills performance compared to other Alpha series cameras or the FX3. It doesn't have a mechanical shutter and has a limited set of continuous shooting modes you are limited to just capturing single frames as fast as you can press the shutter, though these are still raw and you do have the rest of Sony's stills features sat around it. The Pocket 6K does allow you to pull B-roll grabs, but I wouldn't class it as a stills camera. If you're a hybrid shooter shooting 50% video and 50% stills, I would suggest looking at the XH2S and the A7 IV and maybe the GH6 if you lean more towards video. A lens ecosystem is really important when considering what camera you're going to buy, and each one of them uses a different lens mount. The GH6 features an MFT mount, which when paired with its small sensor, 
means you'll be able to mount and use loads of lenses, from old vintage Super 16 glass, modern compact and light MFT options, all the way up to larger cinema lenses. All you need is the correct adapter, which thanks to its short flange, should exist. The X-H2S uses X-mount, which isn't quite as common as MFT or the E-mount used on the FX30, but still has plenty of lens options available and adapting options as well. E-mount has become an incredibly dense ecosystem with so many first and third party lens options depending on what you need. There are also some very decent affordable options now as well. Again, thanks to its short flange distance, there are loads of third party lens adapter options as well. The Pocket 6K Pro is by far the most limited as it uses Canon's EF mount. Of course, there are plenty of EF options on the market, it's just far more limiting than the other cameras when it comes to adapting different lenses onto it. You can, however, get a PL mount modification kit from Winning Camera that will allow you to turn this camera into a PL native over EF, which could be handy if people run in 6K as a B or C camera alongside their larger cinema camera. You can also get focal reducer mounts for the FX30, XH2S and GH6 if you want to get closer to that full frame look. We've done a video all about focal reducers in the past, so if you want to learn more about how they work and why you may want to use one, you can check it out here. Recording media is something important to consider when purchasing a camera system, as some can get very pricey. Both the Fuji X-H2S and GH6 feature a CF Express Type B card slot and a UHS-2 SD card slot. The Pocket 6K Pro has a UHS-2 SD and a CFast 210 slot, and the FX30 features two dual slot CF Express Type A and UHS-2 SD slots. So it's kind of a mixed bag. All have the option to record onto SD cards, but these will limit the data rates you can record and V90 cards are still quite expensive. CFast 2 has been on the market a while now, which means that there are plenty of options available, but CF Express will be taking it over as the more used media thanks to the increased data rates made possible because of the switch from a SATA interface to NVMe. CF Express Type A is the smallest and slowest card in the CF Express range, with B being in the middle of the bunch. B is actually a bit more affordable at the moment as there aren't that many options for Type A just yet. The Pocket series of cameras can record externally via the USB-C port to external SSDs and so can the GH6. While this does add a bit of risk to your rig, using external SSDs in a safe configuration can be a good way to get more storage for your buck. Choosing which data rate you want to shoot at really depends on how much storage you have and what kind of project you're doing. So each camera has the option to shoot a nice thick codec if you want to or a compressed one if you are low on storage. As with most smaller camera systems, you'll need to grab some accessories to get the camera to a better usable state for most professional video work. What you need to grab though will really depend on how you want to rig the camera out. It's very hard to recommend the exact bundle or package you may need, so if you want more detailed advice, get in contact with us via the details in the description below. However, we can take a look at a basic shooting package across each camera to see how much of a difference there is between them. When it comes to body only pricing, they're pretty close. If we try to match the camera's functionality and take the following into consideration, the price of the camera, an extra battery, some media, a lens, some basic rigging and the audio kit, pricing lines up quite similarly to the body only pricing. If you want some more advice on rigging up your camera, get in touch with us now or even book a demo at our Newman House location where you can rig up your camera with one of our technical consultants on hand to make sure your rig is tailored exactly to your needs. So what can we take away from all of this? The Pocket 6K series is an excellent entry into cameras more designed for controlled cinema workflows. The G2 and Pro offer excellent image quality, one of the slickest operating systems on any camera, and a good range of accessories around it to customise your rig into exactly what you need. Being able to shoot compressed RAW in this camera as well is massive, and will be a huge feature for many people. The FX30 is a good choice if you want a camera more designed for run and gun situations. It has excellent image stabilisation, autofocus, comprehensive video features, the awesome optional XLR top handle, and solid image quality. Its only downfall being the compressed codec that it shoots in internally. The GH6 is a similar choice to the FX30 if you prefer Panasonic's image quality and micro four third lens mount options. It also features some video functions that the FX30 currently doesn't. The X-H2S is one of the best hybrid cameras on the market. It offers an excellent blend of video and stills features with an excellent APS-C sensor which is capable of capturing some really great imagery, but it does lack some of the more video specific features that the other three cameras do have. But really, they're all fantastic. It just depends what you want to compromise on. If you want some more tailored advice, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us via the details in the description below. If you have any more questions about the cameras, let us know in the comments and let us know which one you would choose there as well. And if you like the video, please give it a like 
and maybe consider subscribing so you don't miss out on our awesome upcoming content. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you.